I see folks are jumping on the call. We're so excited to have you. We'll get started in another minute or two. Uh, Patrick, you can go to the next slide. Um, but we know last week about 7.6 million people took to the streets globally from all over. And we want to know where you're calling in from tonight. So before we get started, if you hop over into the chat box to the right, type in where you're calling us from. We want to know uh, what area you're repping. And we'll get started in about two minutes. All right, I see Cali, Pennsylvania, Texas, DC. Shout out to Chicago. Hey, Georgia, I'm in Atlanta, come see me. Brooklyn, it's exciting, y'all. All right, California, y'all are deep on the call. Any North Carolina people? All right, so let's go ahead and get this party started. We have a packed agenda for you all tonight. Uh, Patrick, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, but before we get started, um, I want to start off tonight the way I often start off in-person meetings. Um, and that's with recognition that wherever you guys are calling from, uh, that we're on occupied territory of Indigenous people. Um, who call this place home long before us. So whether you're calling uh, from the native land of Tongva in South, Southern California or the Cherokee land in the Appalachia, uh, it's always important to recognize that. And I'm Rail, lead organizer here at 350. Um, and I'm here in the Creek Indian Territory, also known as Atlanta, Georgia. And I'll be your host this evening. Uh, so we have a lot of things to get to uh, tonight on the call. Um, we're gonna hear from uh, some of our local victories. Uh, 350 has um, these local action groups in about 110 countries um, and about 168 here in the U.S. And we're excited to hear from uh, New Hampshire about some of the exciting work that they're doing. Uh, we'll also talk about 350's vision and strategy going forward with our National American uh, Director, Tamara, and then see what kind of cool work you guys can get plugged into. Uh, so enough for me. I'll go ahead and pass it off uh, to Lila, who's going to share a little bit about New Hampshire. Uh, and Lila is the co-director of 350 New Hampshire and has been working on fossil fuel divestment since she was a teenager. So excited to hear from you. Thank you, Lila, for joining us tonight. Great. Can you hear me OK? OK. Um, my name is Lila. I use she, her pronouns. I work for 350 New Hampshire. and. This past year, I have been feeling a lot of cognitive dissonance because on the one hand, we're hiring staff and we're growing and we're launching nodes and we're winning our campaigns. And on the other hand, the climate crisis is still getting worse. Our elected officials still think that we should be building gas pipelines around the state. And in New, in New Hampshire, we're still burning coal. Um, so this spring, we took a look at where we were and we made a commitment to up our game. And this week, we lived that out. Um, so I got involved in climate activism about seven years ago when I was 19 years old. And I've never lived through a moment like this in the climate movement. On Saturday, I walked on to the last major coal-fired power plant in New England with 68 of my friends and colleagues and my mom, who hasn't participated in direct action since the protests at the Seabrook nuclear power plant in the 1970s. 
Um, and we walked in there with a whole lot of buckets and shovels. Uh, and we were met by lines of cops in full riot gear with a chopper flying overhead at the largest direct action in New Hampshire in over 40 years. And while I was sitting in the police van mentally calculating the number of Zoom hours we took to plan the action and laughing about the weird coal campaign themed sheet cake that undercover cops brought to our potluck the night before, um, I was struck with a sense of relief because like many of you on this call, um, I've been educating my community and organizing actions and signing petitions and meeting with my legislators, Democrats and Republicans. And um, let me tell you, the people in power, they so often lack the vision, they so often lack the courage, they so often lack the will to address the climate crisis. Um, and they lack what we have. And for the first time in a long time, we got to directly act out our courage and act out our will and act out our vision for a livable future. And I slept a little easier on Saturday night because while I know it can sometimes feel like nothing is enough, this week, this past week, we took action that is commensurate with the scale and urgency of the crisis. And we did that together as a global community. And I know that we will be back as many times as it takes to shut down that coal plant in New Hampshire for good. And I know that we will be back as many times as it takes striking across the country and across the world until our elected officials take the action that we need to address the climate crisis. Um, so if you happen to be on the call from New England and you're like, oh, how did I miss that one? Or how can I get involved in that one? Um, whether you have the privilege that you feel like you can risk uh, rest or you, um, you wanna join in a support role capacity, um, please send me an email at lila at 350nh.org. I will drop my email into the chat box and uh, thank you all for being on the call. Thank you so much, Lila, and thank you for all your tireless work. Uh, is anyone on Minnesota? Did anyone from Minnesota jump on the call? No. Yeah, Sheila is with us. Okay, awesome. Hey, Sheila. Sheila Lamb is a board member from our Minnesota 350 group, a speaker, trainer, advocate, um, and amazing. So happy to you can join us, Sheila. Go ahead. Take it away. Sheila, you're on mute. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties uh, with Sheila's line. Um, but there are some really cool pictures that she shared with us here on the PowerPoint. Um, so Patrick, if you wanna advance to the next slide. Awesome. Sheila, I want to check in one more time to see if you're able to hop in. If not, no worries. I see you're trying to get off mute and it seems like there's some tech issues over there. Uh, no worries. Hopefully, uh, if you get it figured out by the end of the call, we can hear from you. Um, but I'm going to keep us moving right along. Um, but before I move on to our next presenter, one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, there's going to be options for you all to opt into some of the cool work that we share tonight. Um, and you'll see a poll that will pop up after some of our presenters asking you if you want to opt into some of the work that we're doing for here next steps. So be on the lookout for that soon. Um, but next up, we are going to hear from Tamara, our North American director here at 350.org. She's a writer, writer, policy wonk, social engineer, environmental hyphen, hyphen, hyphen all around baddie, and we're so lucky to have her. Um, and she's going to be talking a little bit about the vision and strategy uh, that we have here at 350.org. You can take it away, Tamara. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so excited to talk to people who are exactly as crazed uh, post-climate strikes as I am. i um, really excited to be here. And as Rel mentioned, I'm the North America director, which means I spent a lot of time thinking about what we're doing in the US and Canada. But tonight, I wanted to really talk about what we're all doing here at 350 and why we need you to make it work. Um, we are here as a bunch of folks who care deeply as ordinary human beings about what's happening in the, in the world around climate 
And we are here because we need to build with people in every part of the country. Um, from every single walk of life, it's really been important to us to think about this work as multiracial and multigenerational so that we can see it in the world. We have to be it in order for us to see it. Uh, that means we have to work in solidarity across issues of race, class, gender, and identities. The biggest threat to business as usual, which is what we're all here to disrupt, is being a part of a movement together that reflects what everyone is feeling as we're impacted by the climate crisis and to exercise our collective power to force change. Um, we need more people to get involved and join this movement for climate action and for justice. So whatever time, money, or resources you have to offer, we need it. We need to elevate the public consciousness so that everybody understands that this is the moment for the fossil fuel industry to enjoy the accountability that comes for getting us into this mess and for fueling the climate crisis, pride crisis while they make a lot of money doing it. Uh, because the fossil fuel industry is to blame for creating our situation, we can't accept a political system that allows them to continue doing this to us and forcing us to pay for it. In the US, 350 is just a part of a global organization that fights for a just and equitable world by stopping the fossil fuel industry, but from continuing to destroy our climate, messing with our communities, and ruining our chances at having a future that we can enjoy. Uh, we're a multiracial and multi-generational organization that works to do this by building a powerful movement to confront and isolate the industry and open up political space to transform climate action into climate movement. That comes down to four different things that we focus on. Uh, we have a strategic vision that is a part of our global work, but the U.S. version of it is building a multiracial and multi-generational organization. That, is allow that allows us access to and the capacity of a multiracial and multigenerational base. That feeds into us being a part of building and deepening the grassroots climate justice movement and building widespread public blame and accountability for climate impacts and making sure that it falls right on the doorstep of the folks that delivered us here in the fossil fuel industry. Uh, finally, that means we need to build the political opposition. So you're going to hear from some really smart people that I get a chance to talk to pretty frequently about what that means and what kind of work you can join us to do in stopping the fossil, industry, fossil fuel industry and building a just transition that doesn't leave out anyone. Uh, we're here for everybody. So I'm going to stop here because there's just lots of us um, who want to talk to you about how you can join this movement, but we need you and thanks for your attention. Absolutely. Thank you, Tamara. Um, I want to pause right here because there's lots of beautiful things happening over here in the chat box, y'all. I see connections being made, resources being shared, folks who are shouting each other out from different locations. And I know many of you have either attended or planned your own action last week, but we can't hear from all 356 of you. So take a moment, head over to the chat box and type in a few words about what it felt like to be a part of the actions last week. And I'll give you guys a quick second to run over there and do that. Powerful, inspiring, incredible, energizing, learning lots about activism. Some folks who were part of the Shut It Down DC, woo woo, great stuff y'all. Uh, this makes my heart really happy. A lot of the youth engagement, yes. Gonna echo that, awesome. Great, y'all. Well, I hope we get to hear more from y'all later on after this call. Um, but next up, we are going to hear about how we get involved in shutting down the fossil fuels from my girl, the brilliant Kendall, our US campaign manager. Take it away, Kendall. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me OK? OK, great. I'm so excited to be on this call with all of you. Um, I'm Kendall Mackey. I use she and her pronouns. I'm a US campaign manager here at 350.org, joining you all from Portland, Maine, which is occupied Wabanaki territory. Uh, I had the pleasure of bringing my 12-year-old niece and nine-year-old nephew to their first ever protest at the climate strikes um, on the steps of the city hall in Portland, Maine with 3,000 other young folks on September 20th. And I can't tell you the experience of watching them as they walk, as they looked at uh, uh, and watched a 13 year old stand in front of a crowd of thousands of people and talk about why this issue of the climate crisis was so important to her and their entire generation. Um, so just want to acknowledge 
uh, this has been a really exciting time to see the new leadership of a climate justice movement emerge and really take power um, and speak truth to power. So real quick, I'm going to be covering ways that you all can get involved. I know many of folks on this call are already deeply involved in community organizing happening to protect y'all's communities from the climate crisis and the fossil fuel industry. But I'm going to talk a little bit about 350.org's US strategy and how you can engage uh, and plug in. So we started about 10 years ago and have been building a massive global movement to fight for climate justice by confronting the industry most responsible for the crisis, the fossil fuel industry. We know for hundreds of years, this industry has been polluting our communities, most specifically black, brown, and indigenous communities, and for decades has been knowingly contributing to the destabilization of our planet and has been spreading misinformation to confuse us about what we're seeing happening with the climate crisis. This has all been fueled by the industry. But September 20th and the week of action following marked a huge turning point in our movement for climate justice. The strikes demonstrated very clearly that people around the world understand that the fossil fuel industry is responsible for this crisis and that we need to hold them and any actor that continues to allow them to operate with business as usual accountable. Our goal is really clear. We need to move beyond fossil fuels. This may sound like a huge undertaking and that's because it is, but the history of social movements tells us that change is possible if enough people rise up and demand it. Our strategy here at 350 to take down the fossil fuel industry is super clear has, and has three parts. One, we need to build a movement big enough to challenge the fossil fuel industry through bold and creative action. We need everybody in the streets demanding change. Two, we need to target politicians and agencies that continue to do the bidding of the fossil fuel industry by allowing permits and other, um, and, uh, like, and other means for the, the industry to continue to expand and we need to stop these projects wherever they're proposed. And three, we need to target the financial institutions, the banks that continue to bankroll these projects at the expense of our communities and our climate. So over the last few years, we've built a huge global movement that's specifically targeting taking on and stopping the expansion of the fossil fuel, fossil fuel industry. One of Trump's first moves when he stepped into office as president was to reverse years of organizing and campaigning and movement building uh, and reverse Obama's decision to approve the Keystone XL pipeline, a dirty project that would unleash the largest carbon bomb on the planet, the Alberta tar sands. The victory to get this project rejected by the Obama administration was led by the indigenous movement in the US and in Canada. And we fought for years to ensure that projects like Keystone that would unleash this carbon bomb of the tar sands would not move forward. This was the first move that Trump made when he stepped into office. And this pipeline years later has still not been built because our movement has organized and continued to fight every step of the way. And we will continue to keep fighting until this project and every project like it never gets built. But we know that the political climate that we're up against, the administration that is currently in power, building projects like Keystone is a top priority in order to continue to do the bidding of the fossil fuel industry. And so that's why ahead of the 2020 election, we are doubling down on our efforts. We know that our movement is made stronger when we work in solidarity and follow the leadership of those directly impacted by the climate crisis. And we've teamed up with indigenous leaders and farmers and ranchers, students, young folks and scientists that are fighting to make sure that Keystone XL and projects all across the country never get, never get built. One project that we've launched in the last few years is called the Promise to Protect, 
which is a commitment that over 30,000 folks across the country have already signed to travel to the route of Keystone XL and participate in creative resistance if invited by the leadership on the ground. This is a huge moment for our movement to demonstrate that collectively we are willing to take action, to take risk, to ensure that projects like Keystone never get built. But the fight is bigger than just one pipeline. We need people in every corner of this country and around the world to be fighting the expansion of the fossil fuel industry from pipelines to power plants to export terminals. We need to stop business as usual for the fossil fuel industry and the politicians that do their bidding. And we need to catalyze a movement that takes our anger from the decades of climate denial to the energy of the climate strikes so that we can end the era of fossil fuels. And we want you to join us in this movement. But it's not just our elected leaders that are allowing the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. The financial sector, in particular, JP Morgan Chase, is the world's largest funder of the climate crisis by a long way. Since the Paris Climate Agreement that was signed in 2015, Chase Bank has invested $196 billion in fossil fuels. Breaking down those numbers since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, Chase has spent $67 billion specifically funding the expansion of fossil fuels providing funding for massive new coal mines, massive new tar sands pipelines like Keystone and Lane 3, and massive new oil pipelines like the Dakota Access Pipeline. For three years though, a broad coalition of groups across the US and around the world has been campaigning to push financial backers like JP Morgan Chase to align its business model with a livable climate and completely stop funding fossil fuels. The campaign has been following Chase CEO Jamie Dimon around the country, dis disrupting almost every speaking event he participated in. They've introduced shareholder resolutions. They've managed to get major cultural and media institutions like The New Yorker and Bloomberg to draw attention to Chase's role in the climate crisis. Uh, and this pressure is starting to work, but we need to continue building it because if they don't hear from folks all across the country and all around the world uh, that they need to stop funding fossil fuels, they'll continue to bankroll uh, the fossil fuels business model. So whether you are with an organization or can join a coalition or are ready to organize local actions, we need you to plug in to this strategy. We need you to join our movement in the streets. We need to join our movement in pressuring our elected officials and our agencies to do the work for our communities and not big oil. And we need to put pressure on the financial institutions that are continuing to allow the industry to hedge their bets on their profits over our people and our planet. So we want you all to plug in. We want you all to get involved. Uh, Shireen, I'd love for you to pull up the poll so that folks that are joining us can indicate how they're gonna plug in, what's the next step y'all are gonna take. I'll pause and see if we can get that pull up. So on your screen, you can see, uh, you can opt into both. We hope that you do. Uh, the first question is, are you interested in signing the Promise to Protect and pledge to take creative action to make sure that Keystone never gets built? You can indicate by pressing yes, no, or you might have already signed it. Lots of folks across the country already have. And option two is, are you interested in joining the fight to stop Chase Bank from funding dirty pipelines like Keystone XL? And line three. So we're gonna wait a second for folks to indicate how they wanna get involved. And again, I just wanna underscore uh, whether it's targeting the banks or government officials um, or plugging into fight regulatory processes the one ingredient that's core to all of this is a mass movement that's demanding change. And that happens when all of us are in the streets, activating, organizing with our communities and fighting for climate justice. So thank you all so much for joining this call. Um, and I wanna pass it back to Rel. Thank you, Kendall. And I'm seeing some comments, um, folks um, are having trouble pulling up the poll. It could be because you have several windows up. 
But don't worry if you're having trouble accessing the poll, I'm going to share a way for everyone to uh, contact us if they want to get engaged in these fights, if you're not able to take the poll. So don't worry, y'all. We'll make sure we capture you later. Um, also seeing a lot of good things over here in the chat box. I saw system change, not climate change. I saw a few folks saying they're going to uh, cancel their credit cards with Chase Bank. That's amazing. Um, and Heather, who is 15, I'm not sure where you're calling in from, Heather, but wants to know how young people can get involved. So excited you can join us, Heather. Um, again, uh, I'll be sharing later on how you can get in touch with us and we can link you with one of our organizers. Um, so next up is our U.S. Remotes Team Coordinator, the fellow with the amazing hair at the top of your Screen. John is going to talk to a little bit about voter registration and how you can get involved. Go ahead, take it away, John. Hi, all. Thanks so much, Rel. My name is John Kwa. Um, I'm a remote teams coordinator and electoral organizer of 350 Action. Um, I'm calling from in from Washington, D.C. on Piscataway occupied land. So I want to give a shout out quickly to 350 D.C. for the amazing shutdown D.C. action that I saw some of y'all in the comments were involved with just a few weeks ago. So inspiring to see that. Um, my job is to connect our 350 climate justice movement to the to ways to engage and influence the upcoming 2020 elections. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how y'all can connect our work um, to our work on that front. Um, we all know 2020 is going to be a very big year for many progressive fights, um, and especially the fight for climate justice. Um, movements have an incredible, incredible opportunity with the 2020 elections to enact major wins on climate justice and on progressive reform at large. And we can do so in a way that builds back into our movements so we can build power um, for the movements that we know need to win way beyond November 2020. Um, those 2020 wins will be, when we're talking about those, we do mean the White House, but we're not just talking about the presidential race. Um, we're focused on building out a new bench of climate progressives in the House, um, the Senate, and willing, winning ballot initiatives for climate action at the state and city level all across the country. Right now, we're working on holding candidates running for office in 2020 at all levels of government accountable to several things, and I want to name four in particular. One, the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge a commitment to drop all donations from major fossil fuel companies so they're beholden to the people that they're actually running to represent and not the fossil fuel industry. Um, a pledge to keep it in the ground, uh, make, to have a record that has fought back against the construction of major pipelines, oil terminals, and frack gas infrastructure, and a pledge to continue to do so in office. We know, as Kendall said, that we need um, we need to keep it in the ground if we want to see a livable future um, for, our, for our generations to come. And we also know we need to protect communities on the front lines of this infrastructure. So the elections are a great way to ensure that we have commitments from our politicians that, will, that they will do that. The Green New Deal, we're aiming to provide uh, amazing green new jobs for a struggling economy while also building a fossil free future. And our day one pledge. Um, which in that we're asking candidates, especially for the White House, to commit to the Paris Climate Accords, to banning offshore drilling, drilling on public lands, and to investigate Exxon day one of, their pres of the presidency, because we know Exxon has uh, deceived the public on climate change for decades. We are going to be doing a ton of stuff on, the, on all of these angles, but in particular, I wanna pull out um, our work to register voters over the next year, especially over the next few months, but as we get closer to the election. Registering voters is so, so important for 2020 for a few reasons. One, um, straight up they're trying to keep us from voting. We, voter suppression laws are popping up state by state and are disproportionately affecting people of color, low income folks, indigenous communities, and marginal, marginalized communities overall. And while we know that voter registration is not going to solve all of what we want solved or even fix uh, voting, the problems of voter, um, voter suppression at large, we do know that starting voter registration drives in our communities and our movements early will help to ensure as many folks as possible have the fundamental right to, to vote secured for 2020. We also know that we can win when we vote. 
we have the majority behind our backs. Most people want bold climate action and are inspired by uh, bold policy proposals on climate change like the Green New Deal and many others. And finally, we know it's a great way to build out our campaigns and our movements. Um, elections are a great and understandable access point to our movements that many, for many, for whom many, it is the first time engaging with po politics and thinking about how politics impacts their own, um, their own lives. Including voter registration as part of our actions and as part of our activism can help engage new activists and build out the base that we already have. We, I would love to invite you to our October 15th training, where on the day of the fourth debate um, for the Democratic primaries, we're going to be holding uh, a panel and a training. One is a panel of activists, including youth activists from the climate strikes, who will be talking about what to expect from the debates, um, what they're looking for for real climate justice champions, some guidance on how to interact with the debates on social media, specifically what hashtags to use, who to tweet at in terms of the candidates and the moderators. And then finally, a training on how to use our new voter registration tool to register your friends and family and get started on that right away. Um, so right now, I would love, um, Shreen, if you could pop up the poll. If you're interested in coming to that training on October 15th, please mark um, the yes on this poll and we'll get in contact with you about how to uh, join. We know, you know, voter registration, the elections are not everything to our movement. We need to, move, we need to be building power in many, many ways beyond that, bold, direct action, many other, many other ways. But elections can be an incredible way to gain real commitments from our elected officials and hold wins that we can organize on and commitments for years and years to come. So I really hope you all can join us and thanks so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you, John. I'm going to give you folks uh, just a quick second to answer the poll. Again, if the polls not, are not coming up for you or you're on the phone and not able to see it, don't worry. We're going to provide you another way at the end of the call to connect with us shortly. Before I move on to the next shift, I want to pause and see Sheila. Are you able? Have you figured out the tech issues? We'd love to get you in if you're able. Looks like we still can't get Sheila from Minnesota on. So hopefully we can hear from her later. Um, but you can go over to the next slide, Patrick. Awesome. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our amazing new Phil team. From left to right, we have Dominique, and I'm sorry, Dominique, I know that that's no spill there, our Northeast Regional Organizer, Cassandra, rep in the Southwest region, uh, and Amira, Florida, Caribbean, and Puerto Rico. You can go to the next slide. Uh, T uh, from California and Hawaii. Marquise is our Southern Regional Organizer, and Grace is our newest, holding it down for the Pacific Northwest. And then we have Junior, who is our Appalachian Regional Organizer. Uh, leading our team is Jamika, the field manager, uh, and the two co-leads, Beta, and you'll see me there uh, with some box breaks. I like that picture. Maybe I'll use it in a Tinder profile. And Michelle, our U.S. Network Organizer, who you'll be hearing uh, from next. Again, if you're energized, ready to take action, but you're not quite sure where to plug in and just kind of want to maybe get in touch with one of our regional organizers, we'll share you an email uh, in a few where you can get connected with them. Um, next step. Michelle on how to get involved and start a new group. Thanks so much, Ralph. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Fournier. I'm the U.S. Network Organizer from Portland, Maine, um, which, as Kendall said, is part of Wabanaki territory. Um, and in my job, I support systems and programs to help grow 350 local organizing across the US, um, an amazing honor to do this work. Um, and going forward, I'll also be focusing part time on local 350 groups in the states of New England, um, where I'm based. Um, and so at the beginning of the call, we heard from Lila from 350 New Hampshire. I'm still hoping that we can hear from Sheila in Minnesota 350. Um, and their organizations are part of a network of over 160 local 350 affiliated groups in the US. And they're doing hugely impressive work to stop the fossil fuel industry and transform our economy and society toward justice and, justice and sustainability. Um, as we know, we need to be doing right now. 
and local 350 groups and their partners are doing the real work of making change at the local level. Um, as you know, any actions that we take as individuals are a positive step, but they're totally insufficient to add up to the scale of transformative change that we need. Um, uh, we know that taking collective action as a community is, is how change has happened throughout history, um, and collective action is the only way we're going to be able to achieve the massive changes that are necessary in the very short next few years that we have. Um, so if you haven't already done so, uh, we're asking you right now to take the next step and start organizing for climate justice in your neighborhood, town, or city. Um, and I, I understand how daunting it can feel to contemplate starting to organize for the first time. I've been there myself. Um, and you don't have to go it alone. Um, the field team members that um, Rel just introduced are so eager to connect with you. Um, we can provide um, coaching and training. We provide toolkits and other resources to help you engage successfully with mobilization moments, um, like the climate strikes. And uh, we have some programs that help center racial justice and equity in your organizing work, um, which is so critical. Um, we have a racial justice and equity community of practice um, for local 350 group um, members and a Black, Indigenous, and People of Color caucus. Um, and we can help you get basic digital infrastructure set up, uh, like a 350 website, um, contact management program, getting your group on the 350 world map. We can send an email blast to 350's list in your area to help recruit new people to join your group. Um, and if there are other local 350 groups in your state, we can connect you to them so you can hear about their experiences, exchange ideas, um, possibly coordinate on campaigns, if that makes sense. Um, so we, uh, we're excited to be able to do that to help um, your local work. And if you're already organizing at the local level, that is, that's wonderful. Um, existing groups are also welcome to affiliate as local 350 groups. And there's not even any need to change your group's name or give up any existing affiliations to other orgs. Um, we can provide all these same supports I mentioned. Um, and uh, the hope is that connecting your local fights to the broader climate justice struggle can really help amplify and grow your work. Um, so at this point, I would um, like to see if we can open up our poll to uh, get a little more information about your interests. Um, so if you can do that, that would be great. So we just like to know, we're curious, are you currently part of a local 350 group? Um, and uh, if not, are you interested in joining a group or starting a new group? Awesome, thank you, Michelle. Give you guys a quick second to answer that poll. Uh, in the meantime, we're gonna try one last time before we wrap to see if Sheila Lamb can join us to talk a little bit about 350 Minnesota. Sheila, are you on? I am. Can you hear me this time? Yay! Yay! Yay. Perfect way. You're right on time. Take it away, Sheila. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to share about this. Um, we are in Ojibwe and Dakota territory. And being in Minnesota, we have a lot of people that were at Standing Rock. So we're fighting Enbridge Line 3 who owned more than a quarter of DAPL. We're also in very close proximity to where KXL is going through. So we definitely have our battle. Part of what we did was change our strategy. We moved our activities out of the Twin Cities and instead went to Duluth right on Lake Superior which is heart to Enbridge offices and right across the water from the Husky refinery. And what we did was a family event that lasted about six hours. It included a march, um, several speakers, including a representative from Bad River who is fighting Enbridge's line five and is currently um, in the process of going to court over that, making them remove their line. 
we had a person come who is a local homeowner talking about the treatment of landowners with Enbridge. We had a speaker talking about missing and murdered indigenous women. We talked about voting registration. And we ended it with a bang with a dynamic 16-year-old who called it just like it is. And she literally had everyone up on their feet, which was beautiful to see. After we had that and a little bit of music, um, we also had our traditional native drums. We went on a march, came back to the water, and the entire time we had family members of indigenous people that are either missing or had been murdered. So we did a round dance and circling them and uplifting them and holding them close and then came back and fed everyone a wonderful traditional Ojibwe meal and um, had more entertainment. We had artwork. We had face painting of endangered species. We had bubble blowing, just beautiful art everywhere. But what's unique about it is most events in Duluth, especially since it's the heart of Enbridge here, are very small. And I'm very happy to say that we had a minimum of attendance of 1,200 people. Um, and that's just the people that signed in. We're estimating that number to be closer to 1,500. The largest event of its kind that I've known of in over 20 years here in the Duluth region. But one of the other things we focused on, and I would encourage everyone that wants to talk about it, get in touch with me, is we focused on the fact that these extractive industries affect missing and murdered indigenous women and girls so much, but also the increase in sex trafficking. And we're getting a lot of pushback from Enbridge in doing so, which means we're doing something right. We're creating awareness. Um, I personally was just named to the MMIW task force that's new here in Minnesota. So they don't like having people that know what they're talking about. So it was a just a huge success all the way around. But we're learning the more we think out of the box, get creative, get original, and get really inclusive of all people, even though a lot of our actions are primarily Native-led, it is making a tremendous difference. And we are getting more and more people joining and teaming up with us. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Sheila, and for all the amazing work uh, that you all have been doing in Minnesota, an amazing group. Um, and if you're in the area of uh, Minnesota, I suggest you reach out to Sheila and the Minnesota folks. Um, so, y'all, for folks who did not get a chance to participate in the polls, you can email us at usorganizing at 350.org. Again, if you're not looking at the slideshow, that's usorganizing at 350.org. If you want to connect with one of the regional organizers, but you're not quite sure who that is, have questions, or want to start a new group. Um, also, can someone drop that link in the, in the chat? Um, the website at the top there, globalclimatestrikes.net, is also a great way for folks to uh, see all the work that they can get involved in. So if you're a little fuzzy and miss some of the call, don't worry, click on that link, and you can see some of the flights, fights that you also uh, can plug into. Um, this issue is urgent and the mandate is abundantly clear that we have to put a stop to fossil fuels. Um, sorry that we didn't have time to go over Q&A, uh, but again, if you have questions, please reach out via that email. Um, going to ask folks who are joining us um, before we get off the call, if you can hop over to the chat one last time and leave a word of affirmation, a farewell, a well wish to your comrades and continue to make connections with each other. Um, and then panelists, you can all come off mute and say farewell to our folks. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, um, for being good stewards in this home that we're sharing, and we hope uh, to hear from you soon. Thank you so much to the panelists and everyone who's for being on today. Y'all can hop off mute and say farewell. Bye. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you, Rel. Good job, Rel.